It is said that there are four pillars of survival. Water, fire, food and shelter. In this video, I am going to show you how to effectively master these components and reveal some key skills that you might end up needing when out in the wilderness. But before I do, I have a question to ask you. Would you be willing to spend 100 days alone in the wilderness with just 10 items? This is the ultimate challenge. For one million dollars, would you be able to survive 100 days in the Arctic? It's the biggest prize in alone history. This is high stakes, my man. How hard can you work for $10,000 a day? But with great reward Yeehaw! comes greater risk. Oh my God. <laughs> alone premieres Thursday, June 11th at 10. That was so funny. On History. I would like to thank History Channel for sponsoring this episode of TA Outdoors. The new season of the epic survival series alone starts this Thursday, 11th of June at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This year sees the biggest plot twist in the series history, survive 100 days for $1 million. No one has ever lasted this long. The series will take place in the Arctic, where the survivalists will have to endure the brutally cold environment and the aggressive predators that roam this land. See the link in the description for more information on the show. Water, the number one resource we need to survive, and probably the number one natural resource we take for granted the most. At home, we can access it through the turn of a tap, but in the wilderness, it might not be that easy. There are many techniques you can use to locate and collect water. Sometimes a simple understanding of geography might be all that you need. Take this shop for example. You will notice a valley with two steep sides. This V-shaped valley was formed hundreds of thousands of years ago by glaciers carving their way through the softer rock. What it leaves behind is these valleys in the shape of a V. At the base of these valleys, there is a very high chance that you will find a river, stream, or some form of flowing water. But how do you find water in areas where there is no fresh running rivers, streams, or lakes, and the climate you are in is hot and arid? If you have on you a plastic bag, you can tie this around some leaves at the tip of branches on small trees and shrubs. Wait a few hours and the sun will encourage evaporation to take place. This water vapour that comes out of the leaves will begin to condense and water droplets will begin to form on the inside of the bag. In this example, it is the beginning of June and the outdoor temperature is 24 degrees Celsius. You can see that within 10 minutes of placing this bag on the leaves, it is beginning to show condensation. And just a few hours later, you can begin to see water droplets forming on the inside of the bag. Although not much, these might well be the vital few drops of water you need to survive. If you have no container to collect water, you can either use a tarp or even use any cloth type material such as a shamag. Hang it out in the rain and allow it to absorb water. Afterwards, wring it out to collect the rainwater. It will hold this water for a while, so you can carry it with you as you move. You can also make a wooden cup from a small log. Just split it into four sections. Carve a small notch in the bottom end of these sections. Take out some of the wood on the inside with your knife, and then lash all four pieces back together again. You will now have a cavity on the inside of your cup, which you can use to collect water. Water is the number one priority to staying alive in the wilderness. It should be right up there at the top. However, in certain circumstances, shelter may need to come first. For example, if you are caught out in the middle of a storm. I have built a number of substantial bushcraft shelters over the years, most of which are inspired by my ancestors that lived and occupied Britain hundreds of years ago. I have built a Viking house with bark roof, an Anglo-Saxon pit house built from pine, 
with thatched water reed as the roofing material, as well as a turf roof Viking shelter inspired by the Icelandic Vikings. All of these are great, but in a survival scenario, they are far too time consuming to build, and as a result, they burn many calories. If there were no natural large rock formations to sleep under, and if there were a plentiful supply of wood, I would opt for a simple A-frame shelter. To build an A-frame shelter, you first need a ridge pole. You can either lash one stick to two other sticks, which would involve the use of cordage, or if you can, you could find a natural ridge pole, either from a tree that has fallen down and is wedged between other trees, or by leaving a long log up against a fork in a tree or a rock. It needs to be sturdy enough to hold your body weight. Best to test it out before building begins. The next step is to place sticks against the ridge pole. In this example, I am building this shelter using my bare hands and no tools whatsoever. To save energy and reduce the chance of getting an injury, you can wedge sticks in between two trees and use this as a pivot point to help snap the sticks to size. Once the framework for the shelter is complete, it's time to add more natural material to make it more waterproof and add insulation. In this particular area, I am surrounded by moss. The reason it grows here is because the forest is dense with trees, which prevents much sunlight from hitting the forest floor. This allows moss to flourish and grow well in these conditions. Rather than rip the moss up in chunks, you can actually roll it, which keeps the root system intact and eventually will help it to continue to grow on the shelter. Moss is a great insulator and it will help protect you from cold winds and rain. However, it will not make your shelter entirely waterproof. This particular shelter was built in under an hour and it will last many months before it will begin to weaken. A great short-term shelter. It allows you a warm place to sleep so you can then focus on building a more permanent camp. There are many different ways to light a fire. Fire has helped humans to survive for thousands of years and it is still used to this day in our everyday lives. The ability to be able to light a fire in the wilderness is one of the most essential skills that you can have in a survival situation. If you have a ferrocerium rod in your kit, you can light so many different types of natural material. One of the best and most effective pieces of natural material for this is the bark from a silver birch tree. Simply scrape the outer bark into small shavings, shower it with sparks from your ferro rod and it won't be long until you have a flame. This can also be done in wet conditions when the bark is damp. One of the more traditional and aesthetic ways to light a fire is by using a piece of flint and a steel striker. Before the match was invented, the flint and steel was the more common way to light a fire. Flint is a hard, sedimentary form of mineral quartz. It has been used by our primitive ancestors to make cutting tools and arrow and spearheads. If you strike the hard, sharp edge of a piece of flint against high carbon steel, you get sparks. If you catch these sparks onto a soft tinder, either dry grass or perhaps man-made char cloth if you have some, then the spark can be blown into a flame. This traditional method of fire lighting is highly satisfying, but it can be difficult in wet and windy conditions. So what if you have no lighter, matches, flint and steel, or ferrocerium rod? How do you then light a fire? The next method is primitive fire, fire by friction. A common friction firelighting method is the bow drill, using a thin stick as a spindle and another stick cut to a flat shape to make a hearthboard, you can begin to make your fire. You will need another stick to make your bow. Using some cordage, wrap this around both ends of your bow 
and attach it to your spindle by twisting it. Burn in the board first with a few slow and consistent movements. Cut a small notch with your knife. This is for collecting the dust that you will create. Once your hearth board is ready, begin to work the bow and spindle back and forth, increasing downward pressure as you do so. When you start to see smoke, don't stop. Keep going for a few more seconds and you should have yourself an ember. Allow this ember to establish and then place it in a tinder bundle and blow it to flame. Getting the ember is not the hard part. Getting the ember turning into a flame can be tricky. There are a few factors that you need to consider, such as the type and dryness of the wood that you are using, plus the climate and conditions that you are in. Practice it in humid conditions, cold conditions, and wet conditions. But what if you have no cordage to make a bow grill? How do you then light a fire? The hand drill is an even more rudimental form of the bow grill, and it is much harder to master. It still utilizes the same principles through friction, heat and oxygen to help you get that flame. It takes time and patience to learn this method, but it is a key survival skill to know. Having the knowledge of where your food comes from and how it arrives on your dinner plate every day is something that we should all have a good understanding of. The ability to harvest your own food from the wild is key to turning a survival situation into a comfortable, thriving environment. Having a good foundation knowledge of basic wild edibles is a good place to start, as you generally won't need any tools or equipment to gather them. For example, the humble stinging nettle, Urtica diosa. Despite its appearance and all too common stinging properties, it's actually packed full of vitamin A, vitamin C, iron, potassium, manganese and calcium. In its peak season, nettle contains up to 25% protein dry weight, which is high for a leafy green vegetable. The leaves can also be dried and used to make a herbal tea. It has been used to treat disorders of the kidney, cardiovascular system, influenza, and gastrointestinal tract. The stem of the plant contains bast fibre, which can be used to make cordage. There are many more uses for this plant. However, you cannot survive on nettles alone. At some point, you will need to up the fat and protein content in your diet so that your body doesn't waste away. The ability to catch fish by rod and line is not only hugely rewarding, but it is also a key skill to have under your belt. Being able to read the water, know the state of the tide, what lure, fly or bait to use, what are the fish themselves actually eating. Knowing how to dispatch, clean, fillet and cook a fish will make your time in the wild much more comfortable. If you don't have access to a fishing rod, you may need to use a more rudimental piece of equipment such as a hobo hand line. You can make a hand line by hollowing out a stick. This particular one has been made on a pole lathe. The beauty of the hand line is that it's compact and lightweight, ideal if you need to travel long distances. You can fill the hand line with either monofilament line, braided line, or even bank line. If you hollow out the inside of the handle, you can use it to store fishing hooks, weights and lures. Once baited up, it can be a little tricky to cast, but if you keep the line taut and against the tip of your fingers, you should be able to feel the fish bite. When you do, pull back hard to give a good hook set. Knowing how hard to play fish, both on rod and line or with a hand line, 
is also an important aspect of catching your own food. Another form of catching your own food is by net. The gill net can be incredibly effective when placed in the right area, but this is more of a passive fishing technique. A drop net, however, can be a great way to catch crustaceans, such as crab and lobster. Simply put some bait in the net, making sure it is secure, and drop it down to the seabed. After 30 to 40 minutes, pull the net up to check your bait, or if you want to be more active with your foraging, swim down and grab your crustacean direct from the net. The benefit of this form of fishing and foraging is that you can drop multiple nets across a wide area, giving you a greater chance of catching fish. If you have no man-made materials, you can make traps from natural materials such as the clematis vine or honeysuckle. Here is an example of one of these traps made by my friend Dustin from Bushcraft Tools. But what if you have no man-made equipment or tools and you need to catch food fast? For this, you can actually use nothing but your bare hands. Crayfish like to live under rocks and boulders. If the clarity of the water is good, you can often spot them crawling around on the riverbed. If you are quick, you can pin them to the ground avoiding their pincers. They taste incredible and you can either boil them or cook them directly over a fire. When you combine all of these four pillars together, that is when you can begin to thrive, which leads on to the fifth and final pillar of survival, and that is the ability to thrive. Once you have access to food, fire, water and shelter, you can begin to make life more comfortable for yourself. For example, you can use bushcraft and woodcraft to create tables, chairs, benches, cooking cranes, pot hangers, and much more. This will help you to keep your mind occupied and it will allow you to focus on thriving in the environment that you are in. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please share it with your friends. A big thanks also to History Channel for sponsoring this episode of TA Outdoors. Don't miss all new episodes of Alone, Thursdays at 10pm on History. See you next time. I think this year in the Arctic the conditions are going to be harsh and it's going to be rough terrain. This is the most extreme thing I've ever done. But I'm very confident that I have what it takes to be the last person out there. I'm going to go 100 days. Extreme hardship. I think the Arctic is going to provide some new challenges, but the extreme conditions are going to be no problem for me. Hope to make it proud, Dad. More than anything, it would be a chance for me to simplify my life even further than I already have. It's going to be tough competition for sure, but I feel good. I feel ready. Bye, everybody. Bye. I'm going to go 100 days. One of the great things about this show is there's no score. It's really you and the land there's a reason that there's not cities built up here, that people aren't running around all over the place. It's Mother Nature at her finest, and she's gonna keep what's hers. I'm just ready to get out there and make the most of it. I've been feral my whole life. I was turned loose into the woods as a little boy, hunted fish, trapped, pretty much lived outside for 30 something years. <laughs> I live it. It's not something I just do from time to time. It's not something I play at. I'm in it every day. It's just my way of life. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. I have a nine to five job as a diesel mechanic. I don't hate it, but I would rather be doing this all the time. A million dollars would give me the freedom to continue living like I'm living probably indefinitely. It would basically mean super duper early retirement. I'm gonna miss ya.